Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Today in incredibly unsurprising news, Tyler Bertuzzi in the playoffs is as we all expected Tyler Bertuzzi in the playoffs to be. Am I the one who's a little rattled that in his time in Detroit, he didn't steal anybody's stick? He waited till he left. Because yeah, it's in the regular season, it's kind of weird. Like, I get it if it's like a, an old school Detroit, Colorado rivalry game, or you know you're playing a team that you know you're going to play in the playoffs. But games haven't mattered for the Red Wings in literally most of a decade. So it just wouldn't have made sense to steal someone's stick. Then the league is like, hey, don't do that. And then it, it doesn't have the, the, the flash it does in the playoffs. But game one of the playoffs, that's a tone setting thing. Like that's actually the coach isn't reaming you out for that. They're saying, yeah, thanks for setting the tone of that series. That's good old school. Get in their head, piss them off hockey. I think I'm just rattled that Tyler Bertuzzi's spent 1% of his hockey career with the Bruins and his career highlight is now with the Bruins. <laughs> hey, just. He had a, he had a four goal game in there. He's not quite yet, but man, it is not surprising at all to see a Tyler Bertuzzi being the perfect playoff player. And it's one game, but you know he fit the bill so far. And B Bruins fans love him. Like if that if you didn't know any better, you would think Tyler Bertuzzi is from the Boston area and has been a Bruin his whole life. And I am going to that is absolute sacrilege in the face yeah. of Red Wings fans. I'm going to get eviscerated for that one. It's like, it's such a double edged sword because one is the Bruins, so it's like ugh, you don't want to cheer for him, but you are happy to see Tyler do well. And you know, if this was where the Red Wings were close to making the playoffs this year, and you're like, this could have been him for us, it would feel way differently. But this is kind of just best case scenario for him. I feel. Yeah, let's hope uh, other key Red Wings players don't watch this and go, oh, well, no, hey, <laughs> no, have them watch it and say, I want to be doing that. And we'll do it in the playoffs, and one day they're going to have to do it against Tyler. And then Dylan Larkin can steal his good friend Tyler Bertuzzi's stick, and it'll all be a, a big happy family. We'll moment. all laugh. We'll yeah. all think back at it and laugh. I'm looking forward to that highlight of uh, Dylan Larkin sitting on the bench with Tyler's stick, wondering why there's no tape on it. it he is a freak. For someone who makes, uh, like, I make fun of you for how insane you are about your equipment and your tape, I agree. I'm on your side. Tyler Bertuzzi not taping the knob of his stick because, quote, I'm lazy. That's insane. For an NHL player, that is absolutely insane behavior. And he doesn't even put a plug in it. Like, I, I don't care if you have the plug in the end of your stick or not. If you're taping it, it doesn't really matter at that point. But I can't imagine how that would feel, even through the palm of your gloves, because you're just basically holding a tiny razor blade at the end of your stick. What if he grips it like an inch below the top? My God, even my six-year-old daughter doesn't hold her <laughs> hockey stick like he that does, anymore. And he plays in the NHL. <laughs> Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi's description is local man. Like that, <laughs> yeah. That's what he is. You love him for it. All right, folks. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, uh, the continuation of our season in review series for uh, Detroit's 2022-2023 season, and a lot more. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we are joined by Max Boltman, good friend of the show, uh, and beat writer for the Red Wings with the Athletic Detroit. Max is going to uh, talk to us about uh, some takeaways from the Red Wings end of season presser, uh, some thoughts on where the Red Wings are at now. Uh, we talk about his article that we, we've discussed in recent episodes, which is the concept of the Red Wings can't do this much longer. So agree or disagree, Max is here to, Same. to, to, <laughs> to tell us a little bit about that and what the Red Wings can look forward to in this offseason. Uh, we're going to continue our Red Wings season in review series, which... Uh, as you noticed, unfold last episode, we were, I don't know why we were so ambitious thinking we could maybe fit it into one show, but it is, this is going to be a three-parter. So today is going to be uh, narrowing down on the defense and goalies. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, world championships and whatever other news within the world of the Red Wings and the NHL before getting to your questions on overtime. Two things first, uh, Wings Money on the Board. If you don't know, it's a campaign that we are running uh, we've run all season. This is our second full year doing it where we raise money for the Jamie Daniels Foundation in their uh, fight against substance use disorder. The way it works is you make pledges based on the Red Wings and whatever event you want to cover all year. So, uh, for example, 10 cents per Mo Sider hit or someone donated you know, $1 for every minute Joe Valeno played, which was incredibly generous of them. 
Uh, so you made that pledge at any point in the season, and then you made your donation uh, to our J.B. Daniels Foundation fundraising page, uh, justgiving.com slash wings money in the board. We'll link it. And our goal for the season is $50,000. Uh, we run this in uh, partnership with Prashant Iyer, good friend of the show, and now a uh, host with Sean Shapiro of Expected by Whom, which is part of the Winged Wheel Podcast Network. Uh, and we are, even though the season is wrapped up, it doesn't mean that's all done. So if you would like to join in the fun, be eligible to win prizes like our uh, Red Wings slash Winged Wheel Podcast custom co-branded hats, our Winged Wheel Podcast flannels, jerseys, lots more, uh, you can still do so. We'll put a post up on wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog. Uh, if you've already made pledges, expect an email, or if you may have already received an email uh, to uh, check in on you submitting your pledges, but it all goes to a great cause. We really want to hit that $50,000 mark for the season, and this will extend through to the draft as well, so there's still time. Secondly, uh, if you want to support this show, it means a lot to us. If you're uh, able to and willing, patreon.com slash podcast. Our patrons are how we do everything on this show. Wings Money in the Board, fundraising for the Jamie Daniels Foundation, Winged Wheel Podcast Nights at the LCA in partnership with the Detroit Red Wings. Launching our own network with uh, uh, our first expansion podcast, which is Expected by Whom, uh, which is that analytics and, and uh, human stories uh, blended together show hosted by Prashant and Sean. All of that is supported by our patrons. You get great benefits like the Discord. Uh, you also get ac- entered into all of our giveaways and access to our very fun overtime bonus episodes. So patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you can support the show. Okay, why don't we give you a break, Evan, because you've been talking for a while here. Okay, thank you. And we'll jump straight to our interview with uh, Max Boltman. Again, Max Boltman of the Athletic Detroit. Uh, awesome conversation to kind of wrap up this Red Wing season. Takeaways from Steve Eisman's press, co- uh, press conference from the other day and uh, what the Red Wings are looking forward to this offseason. So without further ado, this conversation with Max Boltman. Enjoy. Max, we made it, man. Another 82 games. Another 82. The first 82 in a while, right? Or was last year 82? I've already forgotten. Uh, I think last year was 82 as well. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just a more compressed 82. They started later. And, and and I didn't travel last year, I don't think. So this was my first one that actually felt like a real year. Yeah. yeah. Feels normal again? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Although, well, I mean, it's going to be the theme today. I think we're pretty done with just covering only 82 at this point. <laughs> Yes, I I mean it was fascinating. I've never covered the, the the only postseason other than like a college bowl game. The only like true playoff sports I've ever covered is my freshman year of college, the Michigan softball team went to the super regional. That's it. Like I got out of college and did the Tigers and then right on to the Red Wings. And uh that month in February where it felt like a playoff chase was the most exhilarating, like professionally feeling I've had of just like every day you're in there and it like it matters and you can feel it and coming back down to what March felt like and what the interest level was and and the overall tenor uh it was night and day it was really interesting that was a harsh come down that (laughs) that was uh the juxtaposition was you know it wasn't welcome and it made us, I think it made the hurt and it, it put a lot of things in perspective for the entire rebuild too, in terms of just how bad it feels to be bad. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it was just, I think you could see it in the players, you know, obviously I think David Perron had a really good press conference the other day where he talked about like, he was the last guy to accept it. And, you know, I, I think that's one of the reasons why it's really good to have guys like that, you know, around who, I wrote last year about how they seem to really gravitate toward acquiring these proven winners, guys who have um, been in the playoffs before and, and gone deep in the playoffs. And I think that attitude permeated the locker room more. And, you know, I'm not going to give put it all on Perron. I'm sure Andrew Kopp was a part of it. I'm sure Ben Chirot was a part of it. You know, all these guys, but uh, Billy Huso. But I, I think having guys like that who that, you know, they, they couldn't even accept the idea that they wouldn't be in the playoffs. That's a huge thing. And I, I realize there's people who I wrote an article about this, uh, last week and it, you know, some people received it by saying like, I'm, I'm being impatient. And I think that's a perfectly fair read, I guess, but I think it's good for them in the locker room to be very impatient because once, once you accept in that locker room that you're, this is a, you know, whatever, it's just part of the long game. I think you're, you're setting yourself back even further. 
Yeah, there's no shortage of teams around the NHL who will uh, be perfect examples of why a loser mentality begets losing. Right. And so it, it it's a lot of like very uh, um, obvious context as to what Eisman's thinking was, especially last offseason and spending all that money in free agency when the Red Wings, you know, at the time it didn't look like, and now we know we're in a playoff team, uh, even with those signings. But let's jump to that article that you wrote for the Athletic Detroit. We talked about it a few episodes ago. Uh, titled the Red Wings can't continue lottery seasons much longer and you you really kind of laid out how much you know this drags down the fan base it drags down team morale uh the juxtaposition between this feeling and that you know that hot flash in the pan where it looks like looked like the Red Wings might be in the mix where the Pittsburgh Penguins were Buffalo Sabres were up until the end of the season talk to us a little bit about what stood out to you this year that really kind of made you write this now because you know every presser Steve Eisman gets asked where are you at in the rebuild and, and things haven't changed so why now I think it to me it was like a matter of practicality of it you know part of it I think is is the emotional side that you mentioned but a lot of it is the, like just this kind of cold reality that hey now you know two or three years ago when, when you were watching these like late season out of town scoreboard things and you know, is this team going to win or lose? And what's that going to do for Detroit's lottery odds? Like, at least that was like on meaningful lottery odds and a, and a real high level draft spot. Like now we're talking about, you know, they could very well have been picking 11th this year, you know, based on how those last couple of days went and, and had a 3% or 1.5% or whatever 11th is at first overall. Like, this is not even worth it to be for the Red Wings to be like on that, you know, teetering slope this year for Connor Bedard, I guess one and a half, 3% fine. And that's why I tried to very clearly slant it as like, this has to be the last year of this. Um, you can't put all your hope in that slim of a, of a lottery odds. And especially in, you know, the difference between the 11th and the eighth pick, which some years I guess is significant, but, um, I don't think this year is going to really be all that significant. Um, ninth is where I think they're going to end up or, uh, you, you know, barring a lottery win and, you know, fine. Like another year in the top 10 is not a bad thing. And that, that's one thing that I hope came across is that I'm not saying you should prefer picking 15th to 10th. It, it's that the more, the, the longer you continue to rely on just sheer draft position as the motivating factor for a year, you know, the, the less valuable it gets. It, it, it's not the same as it was when it was two or three years ago when we were talking about the fourth pick as the floor for that team. Like that was a really, potentially franchise changing situation. It ended up as four as the worst case. You still got Lucas Raymond, who's a really good player. He's still probably going right around four in a redraft. Um, that's that's gonna hold up really well. But when you're talking about nine, ten, eleven, like I hope people realize it's not it's doesn't have that level of like sure you can get a guy anywhere in the draft, but it it doesn't have the level of like expected upside, I guess, if we want to, you know, do that that it does at the high point to, to sell your whole outlook to it. You know, it's, it's, it's just not that valuable anymore at that point. You got to find a way to take steps now, you know, because you're not winning the lottery from here on basically, maybe you'll win it this year, but I don't think you're winning the lottery from here on. And at that point, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm almost loath to ask this question because it's one, it's been done so many times and two, what's the point? But just kind of looking at the different paths to getting good, I know there's like an idealistic version of what people thought would happen, which is you suck, you suck, you suck, you suck, you you accumulate the best picks and players possible, and all of a sudden you're good. That's not what the Red Wings are doing, especially when you consider the signings from last offseason that we talked about. They tried, mm -hmm. but like it just didn't happen. Like I, I think people still haven't accepted that. Like that you did tank, you did bottom out. Like we're not talking about the Vancouver Canucks who have never really done that whole tank bottom out thing. I guess like the Yulevin Vertanen, you know, years maybe color that, but like the Red Wings were absolutely terrible for two or three years there. And that was their window. And they got some really good players out of it. They got Cider, Raymond, and Edvinson out of it. That's what's gonna decide this. It like you're it's going to be impossible, in my view, for them to get back into that range unless they trade those guys now. Like you're not there anymore. That that period of time is over. It didn't go how you thought in terms of winning the lottery. So now you have to take these players you got who, if you cannot make a good player out of Mo Sider, Lucas Raymond, and Simon Edmondson, a good core out of those guys, that's on you. It just is. They're so talented. They're so toolsy. That's on you if you cannot build a winner around that, in my view. 
So, I mean, then that does answer the question in terms of, yeah, they were too good to to really, under any reasonable circumstance, having to be at that bottom tier of uh, teams like Chicago, Anaheim, Columbus this this past season. So we were talking before we hit record here about uh, the press conference, and you did write an article after you gave up actually a gorgeous uh, Friday afternoon to write this article. So thank you for that. But uh, it was uh, on Eisenman's presser. And though the the words were a lot of the same and the questions were a lot of the same, uh, there was a, a slightly more, I don't know, tepid tone, I think is how you described yep. it. Uh, what did you read from Eisman and, and what the little nuggets of information that he gave us there? Yeah, I, you know, one thing I've been trying to kind of learn uh, over the last couple of years is that while I think Steve Eisman obviously does not want to let us too deep into his brain, right? And I, I think he does a very good job of keeping us out. Um, his, he does have a job that is general manager, president of hockey operations, whatever that specific title is. He also in some ways has to be kind of like CEO Steve, right? And look at this from like a very business standpoint. And it, it can be hard for me to try to parse what I'm hearing from where, right? Um, I thought there, I, I wrote this. I thought there were two moments in the press conference that said the whole told the whole story of the press conference. One was when he was asked, like, how do you feel about things overall? And he paused, took a long pause, took a deep breath, took an exhale, and basically just said, well, I think it's going okay. Which, to me, that is tepid, right? And that is someone who is, you know, aware that this hasn't been perfect. This hasn't been, uh, you know, the popular phrase is like the Iser plan. I think we can say after seeing that kind of reaction that like this has not all gone according to his plan per se. Right. Um, but I do think he still believes in a lot of these players. Like he, even when someone asked him about Raymond's season, he said it was okay, but he, he made sure to go out of his like, I really like Lucas. I really like, you know, I, I forget what his exact words were there, but I don't think he's like, you know, just like giving up on his guys or anything like that. I think it's just hasn't gone quite as quickly, quite as like, you know, spot to spot according to plan. And that to me means, okay, then if you, if it's not going according to plan A, I think there's a lot of people who think, well, then just stick and do that same thing again and plan A will work again the second time. But what I'm trying to get at with what I said, you know, a minute ago was like, I don't think you can just do it over. So now it's what's plan B, right? Continue to develop these guys and hope plan A continues to go how you wanted and augment. Like you have to go add, I think. I, I don't, think free agency has their answers this year. And I, I tried to ask him that directly, uh, my attempt to get into his brain and, you know, as, as expected, he didn't, he didn't want to go there. Fine. But I don't think free agency has their answers. That means to me that you're going to have to go find a trade. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it didn't seem to me like he, he, the, the message that he was projecting did not feel to me like everything's right on schedule. And if that's the case, then what are you going to do to bring it back to schedule? Cause I don't think, I don't think you can just reset by two years here necessarily. Um, maybe, maybe that's what they were kind of getting at with the deadline trades and trying to add new picks. And maybe that's plan B is like, okay, we can't pick four and six again. So we're going to try to pick nine and 18. We're going to try to pick 12 and 20 next year and hope that by that. And that's probably part of it. It probably is. But the other option is you picked up those trades and now you can use them for trades for now players and still maybe even keep your own. So did I answer your question there or am I just, <laughs> no, no, it's like, it's great. And I think you're, you're really onto something, especially with like what I really loved in that article was how you acknowledge that there are holes that they need to fill. That's what Eisenman said. And it's, it's funny to hear, uh, we, we need to get better everywhere, but then also acknowledge in the same breath, how thin the free agency market is. And, and you're not wrong. And Eisenman's not wrong. Like, Maybe they land the top guys at some positions out there. Maybe Severson somehow comes to Detroit on a reasonable contract, uh, and, and that would be a pretty big get for them. But, you know, that's still just one hole of many that needs to be filled. So I, I look at their top 62 picks over the next couple of years, and they have a lot of them. And, and yep. Eisenman has stated in the past, and I believe him when he says he really likes trading those picks for proven NHL players because that's a known quant quantity. You can sometimes find GMs who aren't interested in being good now who will overvalue a draft pick, you right. know, analytically speaking. So 
I mean, there are no ton of teams in this position, but everyone's looking at Debrinket. Everyone's wondering what's going to happen in Winnipeg. It all kind of is adding up to, and I know this is a danger, danger, dangerous road to try to predict what Steve Eisenman's going to do. Uh, it all is adding up to him making some of the picks, yes, but also seeing what he can weaponize in terms of pulling in the proven NHL players who need a new a change of scenery. Probably is going to cost quite a bit, but a big move is going to have to be made if if those uh, solutions aren't going to be found in free agency. That's how I feel. Now, again, like we got to couch this, right? He didn't say that, but like it just, se- you know, that's how it seems. And I don't like, I know that's probably not super satisfying for people because they, they want to know. And the answer is we're just not gonna know, but based on, I don't know, whatever our, what do you want to call this? Perceptions, our impressions. Like this is just how it, that's how it seems to me. And it sounds like it seems the same way to you. So, it, you know, that, that helps me feel like, okay, I'm not crazy here on this Island. Like, I don't know where else you're finding. Uh, you know, I, I think you're going to find at least one, maybe two top six forwards, depending on where these two picks land. You know, if, if especially if you trade up from the Islander pick also into like the thir- top 13 or 14, you're going to get at least one top six forward in this draft, I think, but he's going to be two or three years away. Um, two or three years away, at least from being like an impact player, right? Probably maybe even two years, three years away from being on the roster. Right. Um, but certainly that from being like an impact guy in, in the short term. Yeah. You could be patient with that guy for sure. I think you should, but you also should go get a guy who can help this team be better next year. I think, and I, I don't think that's even, I don't think we're talking about change of scenery there. Like I, I looked at like, okay, like Joel Farabee. You know, that's a guy who seems like didn't necessarily go well with Tortorella. Could you snag him? But, I, you know, in the response to my tweet the other day, I said, like, the Red Wings need to go get a top six forward. Everyone was like, they need a top three forward. And I was like, okay, obviously. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, they are also right. It, I don't know that Joel Farabee necessarily totally scratches the edge. If they can get him, it, it's worth it. They got, the guy's really talented. I think he can be a big part of your team. But I do think it's fair to shoot for shoot a little higher too. And like, what's going to happen in in Winnipeg if they lose early and if there starts to be a dissolution there? Like, could you go chase Kyle Connor? You know, the the, the big name this week is Alex DeBrinket, who there's some reports that he might not want to sign in Ottawa. Can you go get Alex DeBrinket? Those are guys who might score forty goals for you this coming season. I think that's what fans want. I think it would make a lot of sense for them, more sense than at any other point in this rebuild. I have. You know, I don't know how to, I can say, I can swear. I've shit on ideas like that from fans for the whole five years that I've covered this team because it's like, it's not the time for that. It might be getting close to the time for that. And I I think this is certainly the first time where I think you can make a real good case to do something like that. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. The Red Wings dollar, so to speak, has really changed in value where trading a premium pick, like a first round pick, which is what you're going to be talking about if you want players like Kyle Connor. Let's, Let's make that abundantly clear. If you're... If your offer in your, you know, cap friendly armchair GM doesn't include a first round pick or premium prospects, it's it's not happening. And if you offered a, a Red Wings first round pick any point from like 2017 onwards, it would be insane. But now with the team, it's the flip side of the coin. If of uh, you have Raymond, you have Cider, you have Larkin, now you're gonna have Edvinson. You can't be bad enough to tank. It also means that your first round pick isn't so untouchable in trades, mm-hmm. and so it's it's in play again. So. That's uh, that's another frame shift that obviously the Red Wings management knows, but I think the Red Wings fan base um, uh, is going to start to grasp that um, you're going to start to see those picks move if Eisenman moves in that direction. I wouldn't trade this year's Red Wings first, but I would consider this year's Islanders first and then yeah. any future first, I think you could consider. Yeah, because you know, if you're trading a 2024 or 2025 first and you're getting a 40 goal score or 30 goal score, inherently that's worsening that first round pick for the team that's going to receive it theoretically speaking so you know we've already started to touch on it what do the red wings need this offseason let's specifically lay out if you can what are their biggest needs outside of you know the unattainable like we know yeah uh, the right side of d behind most side or what's going to happen what's going to happen in net because that's a thin market and and i think it's crazy to think that uh Ned or Helberg would come back based on performance, but I also don't think it's crazy based on what else is out there. So in your mind, what are the gaps? To me, the, the biggest obstacle with Nedeljkovic is how are you going to sell him on coming back when you picked another guy over him for half of the season? Like, if I was him, I, what? Why would I do that again? You might claim some other guy off waivers in November and then, 
you know, demote me to third and, you know, whatever. So that would be the biggest obstacle to that in me. I, I think, I think Nadelkovic is a better goalie clearly than they thought for the first half of this season, but also than just like he showed over certain stretches. Like I think he belongs in the NHL. Is it as a number one starter for a playoff team? Maybe not. Maybe there's too much volatility, but you know, I think he could play 30 games a year for you and, and be pretty good. I think he could steal you games sometimes. And, and if he had to be your goalie for a playoff series, you'd be worried about what if he has a bad streak, but he might steal you a playoff series at some point. So I think he belongs in the league. I think he will find someone to sign him and maybe be able to have that without the feeling of like, well, this team's already not given up on him, but like picked a, a waiver claim over him for a long stretch, right? Yeah, I think it's fair to say the team did give up on him this year. I, I don't necessarily disagree with their thinking. Like, you know, they they couldn't have his volatility in net and he was having some kind of streak. Um, so it's all justified, but the team did make a pretty clear statement in terms of, yeah, the talent is there, but no, we don't trust him in an NHL crease, and so he's staying down. And he stayed down for a long time. He did. And so, like, that that to me would be an obstacle. But you do need a backup goalie. I mean, uh, I don't really know who the answer is. Like, you know, Varlamov would be great because he's kind of this, like, veteran who can give you 30 games and you kind of know what you're getting, and he's old enough that he, he's not getting any term. That would be fine. You know, I think Tristan Jari would be really interesting, but I seem to be like the last Tristan Jari believer um, in, in the NHL. So maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, I think there's just like, you know, especially if you're not asking him to play, he's going to be injured. Like you just bank on that. But, you know, when he's not, like he can be your backup to Huso or he can, you know, if Huso has tough stretches or, you know, if Huso gets injured, which it, you know, can happen. Then he can, you know, be a, a one for you for a stretch of time. I think that would be kind of interesting. Aiden Hill seems to be the one that a lot of the fan base likes. I think that'd be perfectly fine. I think he'll he'll have a market, but hey, be perfectly fine. So, um, there, I think there's not like, you know, the NHL in general is thin at, in goal right now, but you know, you're just looking for a couple two three year bridge here to get to when Kosa can be your backup and and then eventually ideally your starter. So, you're not looking for a savior in goal, really, right? Like, you're just kind of looking for a bridge, and usually you can find that. Um, Toronto did great in, in getting Simpson out this year, a, a move that I did not believe in at the time that has worked out very well for them so far. We'll see what happens in the next 10 days. Um, up front, it's to me, it is the score. Like, I, you know, I just don't see the answer in free agency. I know Eiserman said there are players he would like to sign. You know, the, the guys who I think stand out to me as being from cut from their cloth would be like, Killorn, Zucker, and Bunting, all three of which would be kind of funny for various reasons in Detroit. Bunting would be absolutely hilarious if the Red Wings signed him. Um, you know, but like, I, I see them, if they, if they were to sign Zucker for like a, a meaningful deal, which I think he'll be able to command, like, how much is that moving the needle for you? How, like, he's better than like a Robbie Fabry, but by how much? I don't know. What do you think? It I, it'll he's make healthier. It, I do get yeah. that. He's healthier. You're maybe talking a couple points in the standings here. A few. So, I mean, and maybe it's worth it. Like, maybe it is. That guy, again, they like winners. That guy has played for winners. Um, he's played with some of the best players of the generation and and helped them continue to be that. So that's a good thing. I don't, I wouldn't, you know, knock a Zucker signing. I just don't think it's the like huge needle moving thing that they necessarily lack. Um, Killorn, I think would be a really nice addition, you know, a la David Perron. Like, I think it would be that kind of deal. And hopefully you, you'd probably be hoping to get similar term. And if you get that, I think it's a really nice addition. I think he brings, obviously that guy's a winner, like a no doubt winner. Um, and, and I think, you know, why would he come to Detroit? Well, you know, Iser, that is something that I think Iserman has not, uh, had any trouble with recently is getting guys to believe that, you know, this one's moving in the right direction. And that happened last year. So those are fine ads. I don't, I just don't think it's the, it's the star score. Any of those is the star score that you need. And, and with bunting, the question is, and really you could ask this question about all three of those guys. Uh, how are they going to look when they're not next to a Stamkos or a point, a Malkin or a Crosby, a Matthews or a Tavares? Like, cause there's not that guy. I mean, Dylan, Dylan probably is kind of in that level at the, you know, he's, I think he scored as much as Tavares did this year. So there's that, but like, and and I don't know how, where he was relative to Crosby and Malkin, not not that Crosby, but like you get my yeah. point. Like it's it's not that quite that surrounding no. talent. 
And it's a tale as old as time. A player plays with world-class players, does really well. By no means should he be discredited, but then goes and gets a big contract elsewhere. And, you know, you still see what made him a good player, but it's not going to be the same kind of production that warranted that money. That's the risk you run into with veteran free agents who have proven it, is you're essentially backpaying their success from previous years. So, you know, I'm not going to make you break down all 82 games, but broad strokes, uh, you know, takeaways from this season that were unique from previous ones. What stands out to you? I know we already talked about that run in February, March, and we can keep doing that. But overall takeaways from this season, how does it feel uh, the Red Wings moved along the, the proverbial rebuild path? I, I do think as much as people roll their eyes at it, I think that that just that will of that team to create that push after the all-star break was a huge one. Like the fact that they did not roll over, this could have been a lost season much earlier. And instead they really rallied and made a push. And I thought that told you a ton about this team, you know, as much as, you know, the early season moments were like that, that Larkin back check and save the goal against LA. And um, I think if we talk about that as like, okay, that's a sign of a good identity. The better sign was, was the February push. And I think that's a big one. Uh, I think Mert Sider, for as much as people may be disappointed that the point total dropped marginally from last year, I think he enters this offseason as an even better player. Maybe you're less confident that he's going to become that 70-point guy, um, but you never know. Like, Miro Haskinen didn't really become that until this year, and spoiler alert, his name appears on my Norris Trophy ballot this year. I still think that that's possible for Sider, um, but even if it doesn't, he's an elite defenseman. He's a number one defenseman. And that's a good thing. Um, Dylan Larkin just missed out on the point per game, just missed out on the 80 points. I think you have to feel as confident as ever that he is a top 20 center in this league. Um, that's a really good thing. Um, he might even be higher. I think over the last couple of years, he probably is higher. So if he keeps this up, like this is, you're in his prime and another reason to not waste it. So that, that's a good thing. Um, I thought Edvinson did progress well, and I don't think, you know, I I felt like again he probably could have been called up sooner, probably could have you know been allowed to play more than the nine. But either way, he made progress. He'll have to continue to make progress. But I think he's a really good player, and I think Derek Alone had a successful first year as coach. And I think he talked about. It. I was really impressed by this. You know, he came in the whole message of the whole year was defense, 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 and they they accomplished that by all accounts. Mission accomplished on that front for them, even with the late season slippage. I chalk that up much more to the injury and, and all that stuff than um, than I do to anything from their standpoint. That was a huge success. He could have just trumpeted that. He was very willing uh, over the weekend at that end of season press conference to say, we as coaches have to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way to improve the offense too, because he did not let them off the hook for that, even given the, the clear success story of what was to me his clear mandate coming in, which was have to fix the defense. They fixed the defense, and now they're going to go try to fix the offense. Very impressive. Exactly what you want to hear out of your coach, that they're not just going to get bogged down into, you know, well, hey, I was asked to do this. I did this. Like, it wasn't good enough um, overall, and, and they're going to go to work on it, and they're not just going to say it needs to be personnel um, or, you know, internal growth. I think they're willing to, to do it from systems, too, and um, that's really encouraging. I, I think that was a it was a success story for Derek Lalonde in, you know, year one. Yeah, I completely agree on on Lalone's progress. It seems obviously uh, this was said when he came in, but him and Eisman have an understanding of where this team is at. So, you know, there was no expectation of him to make uh, this Red Wings team into something they couldn't be. But there were a lot of points throughout the year where we said, uh, you know, better versions of these these squads, either earlier in the season or past season when they were less injured, were doing worse. Like they they were greater than the sum of their parts a lot of times, and I felt a lot more of that as the season went on. And yeah, to the team defense perspective, I think the last I checked, it was like 30 or 33 fewer goals let in this season compared to last. You know, goaltending obviously has a big part to play in that. But all in all, you're starting to see a little bit of an identity in this Red Wings squad, and, or at least the identity that they want, which helps us uh, discern what the holes are um, that the it's Eisenman's job to kind of fill in. Yeah, and th that 33 included, like, they got waxed for some stretches down those last couple of weeks. The last four games, I think, I don't know what the final score was, but they scored, like, three goals, and they gave up, like, four or five per game. Like, you start to trim those down to back with what they were humming along at before they were as banged up as they were and um, before kind of the who-so slide. Like, you're talking about a half goal per game improvement, which is substantial. So, um, yeah, I like, I, I think... It, it was a successful 
uh, season for them in, in a lot of ways. It's just hard to look at it and say that, it, you know, you can continue like this where that counts as a successful season. It does. It, I'm not diminishing it. It was a successful, positive season. And now it's time to raise the bar. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. I guess that brings us full circle to where we started, but a hundred percent. It's, it's what I kind of said closer to the top of the, this segment, which is the Red Wings aren't doing this rebuild in a sexy way where they win Bedard and all of a sudden are going to be in a divisional playoff seed. They're trying to iterate and it's unsexy and it's unfun and it's a grind for fans where you're like, I can't believe we're back down in this valley when we thought we were done with this. But, uh, you know, for all the doom and gloom and criticism, which I think is justified that we lobby toward or lob towards the team, it is moving. It's trending in the right direction. It's just, you know, I don't want to say the Red Wings can't afford to falter, but they now more than ever need to make the kind of the clear, bigger steps to build on the a firmer foundation than they've ever had. Totally. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, that's the Red Wings season, and, and that's a, a kind of look at where we're at pre- draft lottery i don't know max there is a like one in ten chance that we are going to come away from this thinking wow everything that we were so doom and gloom about is now no longer a problem because of bedard or fantilli if if you folks want to believe in that happening that's great otherwise we'll talk after may 8th again with max we have the draft coming up we have a big free agency period coming up even if it is a smaller pool it's i know we say this every year but in terms of interesting red wings off seasons this one is going to be uh, a, a th- I think a thick chapter, or at least it's poised to be. So uh, lots to look forward to. Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit, at M-, M underscore Boltman on Twitter. Subscribe to The Athletic Detroit. Max's articles are worth the price of admission alone. And if you do so uh, on articles that he links to on his Twitter feed, that is even better. So please do it that way. Max, thanks for joining the show again, man. My pleasure, man. Uh, thanks for, for all the nice things you always say about me. And uh if uh, if the lottery on May 8th goes the way that all your listeners uh, hope it does, you will not need me on May 8th to help break, <laughs> break down what it means. I think that one – did you notice when, when someone asked Iserman, like, you know, people say this is a deep draft, and he's, he said – which I, I agree with. He said, like, you know, I think we talk about a deep draft when there's, a, you know, someone special at the top, and, yeah. and that's really – everything else is just a draft. And then he went, uh, with that being said, this is a really, really deep draft. And I think that tells you – what they think about just how special Connor Bedard, Adam Fantilli, Mafi Michkov can be. Yeah. Uh, and if the Red Wings win the lottery and they're going to get uh, one of those three, I think it's really just, you know, Bedard and Fantilli would be the options at that point. Um, it's, it's going to change a lot. And I don't think, you know, I'm not trying to get anybody's hopes up because, you know, like you said, it's a 10% chance. Um, but, you know, it's probably 10% in this lottery. If you were to do like the overall impact, I, would you? You'd probably rather have ten percent in this lottery than twenty percent in a lottery of a couple of years ago, right? 100%, 100 percent, one hundred ten percent in this lottery over whatever percentage in the uh, Slavkovsky draft for sure. Yeah, or even like the the, the Lafreniere draft, right? Like, yeah, maybe at the time we didn't think that, but at the time, no. But now, in, in retrospect, absolutely. Well, needed or not, if that happens, we're. We're going to uh, lean into the the good news. I think it's deserved. But until then, until that pipe dream comes true, uh, we'll plan for uh, an interesting offseason. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. All right. That was our conversation with Max Baltman of The Athletic Detroit. Appreciate Max coming on the show. Uh, As you can tell from that conversation, a lot of discussion to come uh, this offseason as we kind of analyze what Steve Eisman is going to do with the Red Wings. It's not just May 8th that's going to dictate the direction uh, that this team is going. So more on that to come in the uh, weeks and months ahead. But for now, the continuation of our Red Wings season in review series, and we are going to start by zeroing in on the defense. We'll be taking this more or less player by player, uh, overall perception of the defense, storylines from the season, and uh, takeaways moving forward. So in all, this is the first year with uh, Derek Lalonde coaching the team, Bob Bugner uh, running the defense and and. You know, having his hand over the way that defensive group has developed and coming into the year, you know, better than previous seasons. You had the addition of Ben Sherratt, uh, a healthy Jake Wallman, Mo Sider sophomore year. What are your overall takeaways of the defensive core as a whole? I mean, how could you not come away at least reasonably happy? You know, the uh, previous year's uh, Red Wings decor was... 
atrocious. everything that was wrong with his team. Yeah, it was, I'm not going to say historically bad, but like, you know, they did their best. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the turnaround to being league average for most of the season, even above league average for parts of the season, is no small feat. And to do that with, uh, you know, one of the biggest offseason for agent signings underperforming and having, you know, significant gaps on the bottom pair, depending who was up and playing and who wasn't, uh, and the injury status of guys is, is no small feat to Derek Lalonde. It was super impressive what he was able to get out of this group as a whole. Now, obviously, that was largely anchored by three outstanding individual performances. Uh, beyond his rough start, Mo Sider is still Mo Sider and had a fantastic finish to the year. Jake Wallman's breakout could be the most important thing that's happened to this Red Wings defense group in the last couple of years. And Ole Mata coming in and providing what he provided was a very, very pleasant surprise and provides some provided some stability for this season and should hopefully continue to do that for the next few. Yeah, I think the the story of the whole season on defense, yes, there was Hronik's incredible breakout year, which ultimately resulted in him being traded. Yes, there was Jake Wallman's emergence, but really what we were looking at all year is how did Mo Sider handle a full season? Well, he had that last year, but a full season, uh, tape on him, more focus on him as the Red Wings' first pairing premier defenseman. This is the defenseman leading the entire group. And yeah, that first you know month or two, that was it was concerning, not in a way that we never would have expected. It was the his sophomore season. That's again we've said that time and time again. Sophomores in the NHL. Teams are are game planning against you. They have the tape against you. The expectations are higher on you. You're kind of in your own head. And we saw Mo Sider trying to do too much. Uh, and we saw him not really meshing well with Ben Sherratt. But, you know, Jake Wallman's emergence aligned at the same time as Mo Sider cleaning up his game, uh, allowing those two to mesh together really well. And that was the bright spot of the defense. I agree with you, Brad. There was a lot of positives to take away. Even if this, I've said a lot, this defensive group still has a lot of holes. Like there are, there's still work to be done. You know, they're going to have to figure out how to work in Ben Sherratt in a way that's not uh, dragging down whatever uh, uh, partner he's playing with, or you know, not putting him in positions where he can't really do what he does well. That third pair is atrocious. You were gentle with it, Brad. Most of the year, that third pair was an, like absolute belligerently bad. Sometimes Hagen Lindstrom picked it up or had good games, but in all, it was a liability. Uh, but, you know, the positives of Cider turning it around and yet yeah, Wallman emerging and, and Ole Mata doing exactly what we expected of him when they signed him and more, like stabilizing that second pair until he got pneumonia and was kind of knocked down to, to lower minutes as he slowly recovered. I don't see how you can be upset with the progress this year for sure. It was certainly a bit of a transitional year for the defense and it did not start out well at all. Um it it started to look like it was, you know, what we thought was a step forward was we just fell down the stairs. Mm-hmm. Um, like you guys said, Sherratt and Sider pairing never worked out. We were concerned, you know, is that a, a Sherratt and Sider thing? Is that a Sherratt thing? Is that a Sider thing? I think that sort of got figured out as the season progressed and um, the pairings got switched up. Um, but on a bright spot, the emergence of Jake Wallman to play with Moritz Sider is a huge, a huge positive for this team. Um, so I think that really solves one pairing right now. Um, Ole Mata was the Heronic whisperer uh, for the majority of the season until Heronic was traded. So I thought that was excellent as well. I, th- I think it's fair to say Ole Mata got the Detroit Red Wings uh, mid first and a second round pick. <laughs> Honestly, between Ole Mata and Bob Bugner, I hope there's a really nice dinner in them at some point this season because what those two did for for Philip Peronic, Philip Peronic too, he he played the best hockey I've seen him play, uh, really since he's been on the Red Wings. But we didn't think this level was there anymore. We thought this was there three years ago, or whenever when he was you know emerging and and we still had the hope. But he plateaued for a long time, and those two really unlocked him. And we didn't talk much about it because it felt wrong. You know, um, not dumping on a guy, but but you know, criticizing him after he was traded. But his play dropped off with when Schrott ended up on his pairing. Oh yeah, he, he did not look like the same player that he did with Ole Mata. So that was also post Reeves hit. Yeah, it was, and there's probably a lot of context behind it. But it, it is worth 
mentioning at least. So, you know, it can't be understated what Ole Mata did and uh, Bob Bugner, I hope, as well. Um, So the day the Islanders get eliminated, I think Steve's probably taking both of them out for a nice steak dinner. Yeah, yeah. Please, Islanders, don't make this hard. All right, let's start with Mo Sider here. You know, we talked about the start to his season, and I really think that, yes, he did he mesh well with Ben Sherratt? Of course not. Uh, I, I don't think Ben Sherratt's kind of wild card play, the puck or the player, wherever they go, no matter what kind of game, worked well with Mo Sider. You know, who's transporting the puck? Mo Sider wanting to do too much at the same time as Ben Sherratt doing, doing everything or trying to do everything. It just wasn't a good fit. But I don't want to just only focus in on Ben Sherratt. Like Mo Sider, he struggled at the start of the year. He was making mistakes. He was trying to do, you know, an extra dangle or two in a high danger area or trying to do it all through the neutral zone when he, it, it should have been a pass or the puck should have been transported off. And it took him a little while to kind of get his feet under him and, and really shake off the cobwebs in his head. It looked like he just had too much weight. And he wasn't just, he was overthinking things. For he was sure. trying to manufacture the Mo Sider highlight reel when mm-hmm. it just occurs naturally. Like he, 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 like you said, he was forcing things, uh, didn't really play well off Ben Sherrod. Um, but once he sort of just settled in and did what he can do and didn't fo- force highlight reel plays, they came naturally. Yeah. The offense as well. Like he reached his point total. He actually reached a, a pretty significant point total. I know yesterday or last year was a little bit more successful, but over half point per game by one point, 42 points in 82 games, uh, a shade under, well, more than a shade under the 50 points he got the first year in his rookie season. But you saw the points come. You saw the offense come. You kind of saw the way the Mo Sider of last year showed up and it stayed. And that also came up with or came with some, you know, cleaner decisions, some better defensive responsibility. All in all, you saw his game mature and it was just a a little bit of a zigzag path at the start. Yeah, the big thing, especially you use the word maturing, which is apt, because the thing that I really noticed with Sider when he started to turn it around this year, and part of this is on Sherrod, part of it isn't, is he learned when to abandon shit. Because a lot of the times early in the season when Mo was trying to do something, and I noticed this especially on breakouts, if the, his first read, and you know, if you want to compare it to a quarterback, it's kind of the same thing. His first read wasn't there, so he would go to his safety net. You know, For a quarterback, that's your slot receiver. For uh, a D defenseman, that's your defense partner. And Trot often wasn't in the spot he needed to be, and Mo would still try to make something happen. Which usually when your first two reads aren't there, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, the old hockey adage off the glass and out or just make the safest play, even if it progresses to nothing. And that's what Mo started doing a little more is he understood, you know, he still tried to make the play that didn't leave his game. But he understood that, you know, if your first two reads aren't there, get out of this situation. Don't hold on to it too long. And obviously then you combine him starting to do that with being paired with a much more predictable uh, partner in Jake Wallman. And you could really see it all take off, which the irony of all that is, as you were talking about his offensive game, I felt like he was too conservative offensively for the bulk of the season. Yep. I think so. Um, With his skating ability and and his strength along the boards, there are so many more opportunities where I think he should have taken some lanes. He should have pinched. He should have maybe made that extra move to open up a shooting lane and, you know, it's not that he made bad decisions in the offensive zone, but for a team that struggles to score goals, he certainly didn't go out of his way to manufacture extra offense, if that makes sense. Um, he had a really good shot. He started using it a bit more. But, yeah, it, it felt like once he got 10 feet inside of the blue line, there was, like, a wall. And he's just like, I am very, very rarely going to climb that wall. You have to, you you almost glean a little bit of this is what the Red Wings really preach. Like team defense doesn't mean just the forwards getting back. It also means the defense not putting the forwards, you know, out in a terrible position where they have to bust their ass to try to make sure Husso's not hung out to dry. So I wonder how much of that is, you know, Mosad are really just focusing on not abandoning his post and, and putting himself in a good position. We did see, I, I felt towards the end of the year, we saw a little bit more of his offensive flair. Like, we didn't see as many of his uh, body fake no look passes, uh, but we saw a few that led to goals, and they all kind of came in the latter part of the season. 
you're right though. He used to do a lot more, get into the zone, activate a lot more. You know what? But both of his partners, Sherratt and Wellman, those are both very active players in the offensive zone too. So I wonder how much of that is him saying, the team probably told him, it's okay if you're not the one to do it. It's better that we're not blowing three or four goals off of stupid mistakes that happen 200 feet away. Yeah, I don't think it was a team directive. I think it was a Mo Sider decision because we've seen multiple Ben Schrott wraparound attempts this year. We've seen Ole Mata score a goal from the top of the crease. Like The defense were very obviously given the green light to activate. Yeah, And it, it seems just like it could have been because of his partners. And God knows we've seen Ben Schrott in the offensive zone below the goal line. Way more than we ever should have, uh, but he did it, and it didn't seem like he ever got benched for doing it. So it was a okay in Lalone's books, and and I'm not, that's actually not a criticism of Ben Schrott. I like defense activating like he does. That's his best. That's his best yeah, part of his game. Yeah. Uh, sometimes he hangs out a little too long, but I'm I'm a huge huge fan of that what? part of Ben Schrott's game. Brad, as a defenseman, you're not there a lot. When you yeah. when you go to that party, you want to stay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and that's what we didn't see from Cider, and I. I'm hoping that's just a cider mental block. And because if he gets past past it, it can open up. Because here's the one thing, too, that's a little disappointing about not seeing it more from him. You can say whatever you want about Wallman or Sherratt. The two strengths Wallman and Sherratt have is they can both skate. So if Cider goes up, it's not like he's abandoning Danny to Kaiser back there. He's he's putting guys who are able to cover spots, who can move, who have some ability. It's it's not all or nothing if Sider's play does not come to fruition. All of this to me adds up to Sider has more in the tank offensively. I don't think you're going to see, you know, Eric Carlson seasons. I don't think you're going to see like peak Quinn Hughes offensive seasons. But I think Sider, like the fact that a down year where for a good chunk of the season, he really wasn't doing much offensively at all. He still ended up a half point per game player. He has more in the in, in the tank offensively. I think there's a lot of headroom there. You don't really see people zeroing in on it, but it's the space is there. He also had to adjust this season. You saw how teams played him. They every elbow, every finished hit, every slash after the whistle, they were always going after Cider. He worked really hard to make sure that he didn't get sucked into it, so he wouldn't take too many penalties. But that took some adjustment too. So I, I think all that adds up to he's on the right trajectory, and I don't think we've seen anywhere close to what he can do. Uh, at the top of his offensive game, at least in my mind. He's still maturing, right? Like, he's still very young to the league, and uh, playing top-pairing minutes at his age is exceptional. So I, I would expect we'll continue to see more out of Mort Sider as uh, the years progress. Not that it was a surprise. The guy won the Calder in his, uh, as Rookie of the Year in his first season, but that's you you have to feel really good about the direction of the Red Wings that they have their bona fide number one defenseman. Like if that was in question for you, even for a hot second at the start of the year and, and you were hitting the panic button, I think the rest of the year can show a, like Evan just alluded to defense takes time uh, and B he's, he did what he needed to do within a season. Like we, we are going to talk later, probably next episode about the forwards and Lucas Raymond and how his sophomore season still shows that he has some work to do and he didn't really break free of that front funk consistently all year cider turned it around within season and by end of season was in full cider form let's talk about the other fun defenseman and maybe one of the biggest if not the biggest story in terms of surprises emergences on uh, the detroit red wings this season which is jake wallman was his stat line you know phenomenal no nine goals nine assists in 63 games but his impacts all over the ice, the eye test, the analytics, the underlying numbers, all of it. The way Sider's game elevated when he played with him. Jake Wallman has been a revelation for the Red Wings. It see like what a steal what the Red Wings got him for. He was an add-in in a trade, and now they have him signed for three point four million dollars for the next three seasons. That is one of the stories of the year in Hockey Town. The Red Wings forward group is kind of case in point of why Jake Wallman is the best thing to happen to the Red Wings this season. Because what are we talking about with the defense group going into next year? Who's on the bottom pair? Who's the second pairing right deep? We're not even questioning the top pair. We know what it is, and we know it's good. It's such a luxury to have someone like Jake Wallman come out of nowhere, like you said, a trade add-on. Not even the main piece of a trade for the husk of Nick Letty. 
And, you know, analytically, that pairing of Wallman and Sider was borderline elite for most of the season, especially at preventing goals. Um, and I, I feel like Wallman and Sider both have untapped offensive potential like we talked about already. So this has the makings of being a gigantic luxury and one of the main components of the Red Wings contending not for, just for the playoffs, but potentially for a Stanley Cup because this is only Jake Wallman's second full season in the NHL. This is Mo Sider's second full season in the NHL. There's reasonable expectation. They're both going to continue to get better. And with the way Jake Wallman can skate and transition the puck, as soon as there's a competent forward group in front of him, I expect those counting stats to go way up. Um, there was a stat that showed the 10 hardest shots. I was just looking that yeah, up. Was 10 hardest shots unleashed in the NHL in-game this season, and Jake Wallman was on there twice. Yeah, which is also... Why I want Ratko Gudas this offseason, because he was on it like 11 times. Yeah, and, you know, that's one of those things where a hard shot, when you have a proper net front guy, is going to make a huge difference. The Red Wings don't have that right now, not on the power play, and especially not at 5-on-5. Five five. For Wallman specifically, that's going to have to be relevant at 5-on-5, five five because I don't think Wallman's a power play guy. Um, he can fill in adequately when needed. But, yeah, I, it, it's unbelievable to me the strides he made this season and just how much... Him and him alone changed the tra trajectory of this defense group for the next three years. And as uh, Evan had to uh, leave for something verifiably urgent, uh, yeah, Wallman's game really was, I don't know, the, there was a lot of promise when the Red Wings traded for him and, and we talked about his tools and his attributes and Eisman noted that he had been watching him since Eisman was in Tampa Bay and it was always a prospect. Wallman was always a prospect that he liked. We really never thought it would emerge like this and this quickly. It's just one of those uh, convenient confluence of events where the player was, you know, behind a strong defense core in St. Louis for so long and was injured. He missed the start of the season with his uh, shoulder uh, procedure and, and had to shake off the rust after that and get up to game speed. But it's been full steam ahead ever since. The kind of player that he is, like incredible skating, cannon of a shot that I'm excited to see him use more. Uh, the way he reads the ice, especially in the defensive end next to Mo Sider, like his positional and defensive IQ is actually very high. Uh, is he a perfect player? No, by not by any means. He does sometimes get caught. Um, I've seen the Red Wings. The, it, it, every defenseman at the, at some point this season has kind of gone through those gone through those pains where they've uh, gotten caught too deep or or made a mistake. But by and large, the impacts he's had on the ice have been uh, phenomenal. Now, one thing that really stands out to me with Jake Wallman is he seems to elevate whoever he's playing with. So I know Brad, you mentioned like, oh, he's going to be part of the top fair top pair in Detroit for as long as they need him to. That's great, but let's imagine a world where Simon Edvinson, you know, does enough to make that top pair, and he really meshes well with Mo Sider. Hypothetical. Well, you know you can stick Jake Wallman on that second pair, and that second pair is automatically way, way better. That's not something that translates. Not, not every player can play up and down the lineup, and for a defensive group that's been, let's play our two best defensemen as much as possible, and that's going to be our whole ride all season. Like, this is a really... He is a pivotal player in the Red Wings' uh, defensive future. So nine goals and nine assists all year. That's obviously not massive numbers. Is that... I don't want to say let's guarantee like a 50-point season from him next year or anything. Like until he does that, you don't know what his actual ceiling is. But I can't help but think that 18 points in 60-some-odd games, that can't be that. That's all that Jake Wallman can produce just based on what we've seen, right? Well, Jake Wallman's specialty is the transition. Mm -hmm. And the forwards he's moving it up to are doing jack yeah. all with it when they get it. So you get a transition specialist with a good forward group eventually, you know, not to oversimplify, but with a good forward group eventually, you got to expect those numbers will go up. With a shot like he has, you got to expect that those goal totals will at least remain around the double digit mark at a minimum. And, you know, part of assists is, again, those point shots with a shot that hard. With some more talent in front of him, some of those shots are getting deflected. Some of those rebounds are going in, and those weren't dropping for him this year. So, I mean, as well as he played, there's some factors that are definitely in play around him that should, in time, boost the offense. 
And he's still young. Like He's not Mo Sider's age or anything like that. You, you have to remember that Jake Wallman uh, had a little bit of a longer path to uh, being a full-time you know, top pair defenseman. Uh, he's 27 years old, so uh, just turned 27 in February. So I don't think his athleticism or his, you know, tools are going to be more than what we've seen so far. But that's not a knock. He's this is a guy who's playing or should be playing at or near his athletic peak. So more time, consistent opportunity up there. At the very least, you have a bona fide top four guy. He's a big body too. People don't really think about that because he's not six five, and so he's shorter than most of the defensemen that. Uh, uh, Steve Eisenman drafts and brings in, but he's a big body and he fits the Red Wings system really well. So it's just been wins through and through. Any knocks that you have against Jake Wallman, I don't think are any that you couldn't pick out against uh, any other defenseman that the Red Wings have had. Uh, Cleaning up mistakes and and focusing on not putting yourself in a bad position or turning the puck over, I think they'll probably work with him on that, but that's like working in the margins and to, to perfect your game rather than something that's actively hurting the Red Wings. What's funny is at the Winged Wheel podcast day on April 8th against Pittsburgh, that turnover to, was it to Crosby? It was to Crosby. Yeah, I was actually uh, explaining to someone, they're like, I just got into the game. Tell me a little bit about why Wallman so much, uh, why Wallman is so much of a revelation and was explaining it to them. And at, like, as it happened, Wallman turned that puck over. And I was like, well, that's So what you're me. saying is it was your fault. Got it. Yeah, it was my fault. Okay, let's, um, let's do the Ben Chirot conversation. Ben Chirot. Yeah, you know what? He was brought in uh, in the offseason $4.75 million uh, for four years. This was the first of those four years. And the idea was he is going to eat a lot of minutes. He is going to be a veteran presence next to Mo Sider. He is going to uh, play with some snarl and bring some not just leadership off the ice, which he really does do. Uh, the room loves him for a reason, and he's always the one to address media. Uh, but he's also going to bring that edge to the ice and make sure that the Red Wings don't get pushed around and just play solid, reliable minutes, not as a defensive stalwart. I think you you talked about it a lot preseason. Anyone who thinks that just because veteran means solid defensively, that's not the case with Ben Trott. That wasn't his game, but someone who would be a net addition to the Red Wings. And he's had, to put it gently, a complicated year. Let, let's call a spade a spade. He just didn't work on that top pair. It was not a good result. Was it all on him? No. I think Mo Sider really went through it as we just talked about at the start of the year. He was figuring out his game, but it just didn't work out on the top pair. And after that, I know he had some injuries throughout the year and he, he's gone through a lot off the ice as well. But it's I don't think this first year, I don't think it's unfair to say this isn't how the Red Wings wanted this to go. Well, when I was being gentle about the bottom pair before, you uh, you decided to play bad guy and describe it as it is. So I guess it's my turn. Yeah. He was horrible. He he had very few redeeming moments this season. And I think you're right about the veteran leadership. He absolutely looks like a leader in the room, and he talks like a leader in the room, and you can tell his teammates love him and look up to him. And those are all very fair and valuable things. On the ice, he was a net negative player, which is a tough pill to swallow when you're when a guy's making almost five million dollars. He was brought in to be the complimentary piece alongside Mo Sider, and he dragged him down. Most uh, Philip Hronik was in the midst of a breakout season, and when Schrock got anchored next to him, Hronik's season started going in the tank. Not in the tank, but it, it was not close to what it was with Ole Mata. The eye test uh, for Ben Schrock was not kind to him. The analytics were somehow even worse. The counting stats were bad. It's you can see the appeal. You can see the talent. He is a phenomenal skater. Really good shot. Great mindset on the ice. Super aggressive. I love it. Everything about Ben Schrott screams, this guy is going to be a super tough, super effective top four defenseman that the opposition is going to hate playing against. His decision making is so poor it cancels out all of that and then some. You he, talk about the worst case scenario of Toolsy, like that's what yeah. we saw this year. Yeah, so yeah, going into the draft, if you hear hear Toolsy, but we're not sure if he'll put it together, here's the the flip side of it. Because yeah, I love a defenseman who will step up for a hit. Uh he does it at all the wrong times. I love a defenseman who'll pinch in the ozone, he does it and hangs out a little too long sometimes. 
defensive positioning, I just, I, again, Ryan, I'll let you explain this to me, but I just can't process what he's thinking in some of the decisions he makes in the D zone. I, I don't know why he, what he's seeing when he makes some of his reads. I don't know where he's going in some of his coverages. It's just so unbelievably frustrating because, you know, we've dumped on Red Wings players in the past who made too much money and were net negative players and just, but most of them was just due to lack of talent. You could, you know, not that it was his fault. You watch Danny DeKaiser in the later years and you go, yeah, man, he, he's falling it, apart. It's awful, but you just, he can't skate. Like you just watch him, you're like, he can't move out there. And, you know, that's been true of a lot of defensemen. That's not true of Schrott, and that's the piss-off. You know it's there. You know if he puts it together, it can be there. But he's in his 30s now. He's not going to. That's the unfortunate reality. A player just doesn't learn to think the game differently in their 30s. So, unfortunately, it was a rough first season, and I don't see it getting better. See, that's where I disagreed. And it might just be because I have naive hope, but when I see a guy... Like, you made the comparison to DeKaiser, and really as that DeKaiser season went on, it became evident. The brain is there. Like, the, the way DeKaiser thought the game, it wasn't a wonder as to how he was so effective before his multiple, like, knee, hip, whatever, back injuries. You see Ben Sherratt, and no, I don't think you can teach the hockey IQ, like, a sudden jump this late. But then you also look at his on-ice impacts year over year, and some of this is going to be the team that he was on, and some of it's going to be just random chance. But, you know, I'm looking at uh, Micah McCurdy's uh, hockey viz right now. He performed really well with Montreal, and he performed for about half the time with Winnipeg pretty well. We are seeing probably the worst, if not some of the worst versions of his uh, uh, career in terms of on-ice impacts since his early time in Winnipeg, but eight years ago, nine years ago, almost. That to me says there's more to this. Like, I think we are seeing the worst of his attributes emphasized. And I think we are seeing, I'm not going to call it random happenstance, but just the way everything shook out the season for the Red Wings with the positions he was put in, uh, his deployment. And I don't really know what happens on the back end in terms of what they've asked him to do, but it, you, you, it, well, I agree with you. It was frustrating because you could see the tools were there and just the same mistakes were happening. What does he do well? Like you said, phenomenal skater with the puck on his stick in the offensive zone. Generally, good things happened. You know, had that edge. I think he was in, as much as you might not think it matters, the Red Wings got pushed around too much and have been for the last half decade. And he was in there a lot of times this season, punching someone in the face or, or getting them off Raymond or whoever. I don't think everything else has to be as bad as it was this year. I don't think you're wrong to call it bad. I agree with you, Brad. Like, it was bad. But I think that's a surprise for Sherratt, and I think that's a surprise for the team. I don't think it had to be like this, and I think there's probably some deployment questions that can be addressed to to make this... You to, have to... To minimize the damage. Yeah, it's it's mitigation, right? You You accentuate a player's best attributes and you put them in positions to succeed there. I mean, that's hard to do when you need him to eat a lot of minutes. But then again, like, I don't know. Like, I don't... I just have a hard time thinking that all of a sudden on Detroit, it is only bad all the time when with Montreal, with a limited time in Florida, with Winnipeg, you saw him outperform expectations. So... I think there's a lot of thinking and work that needs to be done there. And frankly, that has to be priority one for the for the Red Wings defensive uh, group in thinking this offseason. Derek Lalone, Bob Bugner, everyone has to think, you know, you have Ben Sherratt's contract for the next three years. You can buy it out. You can trade it. Those things are very possible. I, I don't want to say they're impossible. But until you do that, or if unless you do that, you have to figure out how to make him work. Because imagine Ben Sherratt is a net neutral. This defensive core with Ben Sherratt, Jake Wallman, Mo Sider and Oli Mata or whoever else, that's and Ben Schrott's net neutral. That is the key to unlocking this. That's a, a, a sufficient NHL defensive core. That is a team that can fight for wild card, uh, a wild card spot. That's a team that's playing meaningful games, you know, up until April even. That has to be the priority for the Red Wings. I, I don't want to offload this. Like, I'm not trying to make excuses. I, I don't disagree with what you said uh, by and large, but. This is what you have. You have to work with it. And and if you can elevate Heronik's game overall like you did this season, 
you have to do the same thing with Ben Sherrod or at least try. Because the conundrum here is it's getting harder for him next year because if you expect Simon Edmondson to be a full-time Red Wing next year, which he should be, Ole Mott and Jake Wallman just got extended. That's a really good left side of your D. You don't screw with that. So they're going to need Sherratt to go to the right side, which is going to be more difficult. Now, credit to Sherratt. This is one thing he can and has done, Yeah, which definitely is a huge advantage to have someone who can do that in a particular situation uh, like the one the Red Wings are in now. So you put Sherratt on the right side with Edvinson or Mata, preferably Mata, <laughs> and you sign a right-handed D to, you know, for the other pairing. And that does solve some problems, but man, I I hate saying this because it's the one thing I love about Sherratt. Lalone has to tell him to calm the hell down. He has to not jump into every single play, not chase not, every single puck. Not step for hits, not chase, not pinch. Like not- make make the game of hockey as ridiculously simple as possible for Ben Sherratt understanding that's going to minimize his strengths, but it's also going to severely mitigate his weaknesses. his weaknesses. And is that what you want to do with your $4.75 million defenseman? No, but that contract was a mistake from the day it was signed. I don't care about how much money he makes. Well, I care about how much money he makes at this point, but you can't deploy him or utilize him based on that number. You can't, you have to get him to just be a serviceable NHL defenseman. And if that is 13 minutes on the bottom pair on his off wing, offside, so do it. So be it. Sorry. Because hopefully that solves the problem and then you can kind of, I don't know the way to phrase this, ramp him back up once he's got a better understanding for the loan system, for, you know, what his weaknesses are and how to prevent them from being exploited. I I don't know how to phrase this, but basically shut him down to build him back up. I I totally agree. And that's an adjustment that I'm surprised didn't happen in the season. And please know that we are very oversimplifying for the sake of not running four hours on just like systems here. Uh, What we're talking about in terms of the the systems and and types of hockey changes that need to be made. Uh, But, yeah, I, I'm shocked that that adjustment wasn't made mid-season. I've said it on this podcast. We've talked with a lot of people about it. It's not something that it's it's not hard to discern what's going wrong uh, with Ben Sherrod's game as the season progressed. We saw Tyler Bertuzzi. He really struggled when he was joining uh, or rejoining the Red Wings. I know he was hurt and had to you know shake off a lot of rust, but and was injured multiple times. There was. There was a lot of frustration with Bertuzzi and with the team because Bertuzzi just wasn't buying into the loan system. Like that was a real thing. With Jacob Vrana, even before Vrana entered the player assistance program, there was there were concerns in terms of his selfish style of play, uh, which is how it was referred to sometimes, and him buying into the team defense Derek Lalonde system. Both those players, like Vrana was shipped for a multitude of reasons like there was a lot that went into that and that was very complicated and Bertuzzi was shipped because of uh, uh you know because they got a first round pick plus and his they weren't going to give him the seven years that he was requesting but they were applying rigid structure to those guys I'm not saying they weren't trying the same thing with Ben Sherratt and I don't I don't want to imply that I know what all the conversations that happened in the back end obviously we don't but yeah I, I was surprised that those adjustments weren't made but I agree you you need him to be a four or five guy in terms of the minutes and you need him to really simplify his game. And then what happens after that? You Who knows? If he can do it consistently, you deploy him in, in situations. It's harder to do on defense, but you deploy him in situations where he's getting more offensive zone time. You know, he's with someone who can cover for him. I wonder what Ole Mata could do for him. Like there's a, there's a lot that you can kind of try and tinker with. Generally, a guy who's this toolsy and this experienced, you can get more out of him. If this was Danny DeKaiser when his body was completely broken down, like there's nothing you can do there. Danny DeKaiser's career couldn't have been extended short of being, you know, a half cyborg. And that's unfortunate. I wish we could have done that for him because it would have been really great. He was one of my favorite defensemen of all time, but uh, of this generation of the Red Wings. But 
that is what it is. With Ben Chirot, there's still the physical tools are there and the experience is there and the past performance is there. I think the Red Wings can unlock this. Ole Mata, let's talk about him. What, you know, we talked about Jake Wallman as a revelation, and I think if Ole Mata had not contracted pneumonia partway through the season, we would having be having a much bigger discussion about him. But, man, the Red Wings really do owe him a nice dinner for what he did for Philip Peronik and the stabilizing force he brought to the Red Wings defense. Yeah, because the conversation going into this year, it's amazing how quickly a narrative can change because all last offseason was what a catastrophic disaster the left side of their defense is. What in the hell are they going to do? And now all of a sudden we're going, oh, yeah, uh, all three spots are full and we actually have to ship one of them to the right side. Yeah. And we're happy. Nobody's complaining about a left side of Jake Wallman, Simon Edmondson, and Ole Mata. If Simon Edmondson gets anywhere near his ceiling, that's a championship left side. You have three very, very effective defensemen, albeit in different ways, but three very effective defensemen. And Wallman was found money. Ole Mata has found money. Those they, two negate whatever overpayment to Shraw in my mind. Yeah, no, agreed. A thousand percent agreed. And Edvinson's entry-level contract, mm-hmm. three years left on that, three years of Ben Shraw. Anyways, um, mm-hmm. I mean, the argument still should be made that they shouldn't have done that with Edvinson. But either way, um, Mata isn't anything special. He isn't dynamic, but he's smart, responsible, and has enough skill in his tool belt to do what he needs to do on the ice, which isn't fancy, which isn't flashy, never is, never will be. Had a little bit more offense than we thought he would have. Um, and, yeah, I, you, you talk about that bringing in that veteran, simple defenseman to stabilize – like, you hear terms like that thrown around a million times and nobody understands what the hell it means. Ole Mata is what it means. Every coach in the NHL wishes they had two to three Ole Matas. Six goals, 17 assists for 23 points for a guy who's really supposed to be just like a third-pairing stabilizer. I'm sorry. I, I know he, that's not, you know, world beater, but that's fantastic. Every coach in the NHL would love to have that. He That's his... Second highest career point total. He got 29 points with Pittsburgh twice. Uh, that's more than the Red Wings bargained for when they when they thought they got him. Every single coach in the NHL wishes they had multiple Ole Matas because he's not invisible on the score sheet. And yeah, like you said, he is. He just does everything. He does the fundamentals. He's yeah, it's plain Jane, but sometimes you want plain Jane. It is your meat and potatoes type defenseman. And it's not just you you go out there and you can rely on him to not make a mistake and his shift is at at net neutral. Look what he did for a player who's very different than him in Philip Peronik. Philip Peronik's an activate on offense, you know, defensive liability too often throughout his career kind of guy who needed extra care to work with him to really enhance his game. Part of that was Peronik getting better. Part of that was the Red Wings working with him, especially as Bob Bugner came in as a defensive coach. Uh, you know, part of that is Ole Mata sticking him next to him. Your partner makes a, a world of difference in terms of how you play defense. You talk about Jake Wallman being able to play up and down the lineup. I have no concern about Ole Mata playing on the second pair. I actually like him on the second pair. You hope the only reason that he's not is because, you know, Edvinson, Johansson, whoever else, they're all coming in and, and earning more minutes. But fantastic season from Ole Mata. You know, the the most... Brutal you can be towards him is that he wasn't a world beater offensively, but still 23 points for a guy who's supposed to be only like a, a defensive defenseman. I'll take it. I That's a coach's defenseman. Easily. Like, wh- what a story for him. And signed for uh, for $3 million moving forward for, for two more seasons. So, again, it's a bargain. It's the little things in a rebuild that really push you forward because if he doesn't turn out to be a long-term solution beyond the two years... Hey, he buys you time in the transition, and he will do it very well. Yeah, he's 28 years old right now. Can you add a Mo Sider every year? No. But does adding a, an Ole Mata make the previous iterations or make the Red Wings' defense better compared to previous iterations? Yeah. Because previous iterations of the Red Wings had players like Hag and Lindstrom and Osterley higher up in the, their top four. And I hate to dump on those guys. <laughs> uh, catching, we will shortly. Don't worry. They catch strays for no reason here. But, you know, those guys shouldn't be in the top four. And players of that caliber have been. 
through the throughout the entire rebuild. So you add Olimata types, and these are the dividends it pays. It's not just their performance on the ice. It's not just every shift they're go, they're out there they're responsible. They make good players better. The big benefit of adding Ole Mata last season and then extending him mid season is not having to add an Ole Mata this off season. I, I will. I hope they do though. I mean, we need a right handed one. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. But it's also like it shows you the attainable moves, the ones that. I can't believe I'm a person who says this so much. I don't know why I've started saying it, but it's not the sexiest move to to sign the Ole Mata types in free agency. You're not going to be – that's like fifth on the list of, of uh, ticker items for your team on that day's news. But look at the impact. This and, is some money ball bullshit. It is. And you know what? It's attainable. Like it, it, no matter how good the free agency class is, there's always a player or two like that. Are you going to hit every time? Is there like an Ole Mata – bargain bin no not that not all of them will work out this way and the red wings have experience in that <laughs> how many dozen have we experienced like that but it shows that you can do it and it shows that not every move has to be you know espn highlight of the night okay simon edvinson nine games training camp and end of the season uh simon were completely different players what are your takeaways from his nine game audition relative to his start to the season well, you can't help but be pl- very pleased with the progress he made. Um, he didn't turn everybody 180 on the concerns, but he certainly eased a lot of the concerns. His defensive play was really good, as good as you could expect for a 19-year-old defenseman in a nine-game NHL sample size playing on, a at that point, horrific team. Yeah. Um, but it was good. You could see he really started to understand defensive positionings, uh, how to utilize his reach, uh, how to utilize his mobility. You could see he was understanding his tools and how to implement them as on the defensive side of the game, which was uh, very good. He looked excellent in his gap control off the rush and, again, really utilizing his size. Because if you draft a, a seven foot two defenseman, you hope he understands how to use his frame, mm-hmm. you know, to give uh, 14 feet of, you know, you cannot pass. Yeah. Uh, here and he really, really did understand that. But that's a big triangle, though, between your body and the stick. Like I, you could skate through that. Yeah, he actually uses a fairly short stick for someone his size, which I don't know if I like or or hate that. Uh, people who understand defense more than me, I'll I'll, I'll defer. Um, well, you have the dangles that he has. I'm, I'm sure he wants to deal with less. Uh, well, a shorter stick minima- mitigates that, minimizes that triangle you're talking about, but it also lessens his reach, which was one of the big attributes. But in theory, it does improve his stick handling. His shot really is lacking for someone his size. So, you know, there's gives give and take here. Um, I like that in the last few games, we really finally started to see him assert himself a little more offensively. Um, one play to isolate it in particular in the game we were at against Pittsburgh, where he was walking the just inside the blue line uh, from the left side to the right side. And he saw the way that the Penguins attackers, defenders, whatever you want to call them in that situation, kind of were offset one a little lower than the other. And he just had this really quick, hard cutback um, on his backhand to the direction he was coming from and split them perfectly. And I think the shot he took got deflected or something, but turned a nothing play into an A plus scoring chance, which was just just that movement, that pivot, that stick handle, that that is not a move A most defensemen see or B can even execute it if they see it. So to see stuff like that from Edvinson, again, super impressive. Lots of reason for optimism. All that being said, I still have tremendous concerns about his pace and not concerns that I think it's going to prevent him from being a very, very good NHLer. I think it is going to prevent him from reaching his ultimate offensive upside because a lot of what he does, impressive though it is, God, he just does some of it so slowly. And and it's a half step behind. It's a half step too slow. The decision's made a half second too late. And again, some of that will improve in time, but going into the draft, my big concern with Edvinson was pace. Mm-hmm. Coming out of the draft, my big concern with Edvinson was pace. Now watching him after his nine-game stint with Edvinson, arguably my only concern about Edvinson is pace. But that concern has never gone away. 
So I I think ultimately that's always going to be an issue for him, which again, it's not the end of the world. I do think if you're hoping for a 50, 60 point Simon Edmondson, like a Mo Sider type offensive impact, it's not going to happen unless he figures that out. And we've seen cases of guys figuring that out in the past, but it's pace is usually something that lingers forever and doesn't get solved more often than not. So, and again, I'm not sitting here and going, yep, that's the end of Simon Edmondson. No, we've still got a very effective uh, borderline elite potential player here, even with that. But it's worth noting that that question didn't seem to be answered in his nine game stint. So, no, I, I agree with your assessment of him. And, and I'm really, I said previously that I, the promise that was shown by Simon Edmondson and the progress from his uh, preseason training camp to now, that answered a lot of questions for me. Because often when you get a, a you know, we, we probably have overused the word risky with Edmondson, but when you make a pick like that, that isn't a sure thing. If you don't see that progress early, then some alarm bells are ringing. And I was very happy to see that his time in Grand Rapids translated into a much more comfortable Simon Edmondson. I still did see some nerves and hesitation from him. Uh, obviously, he has to clean up his game in, in, in the matters or the areas that you talked about. But yeah, overall, you see him making a difference on the ice and utilizing you know the skills that made him a top uh, pick for the Red Wings. I, I agree that the pace is the primary thing that he has to focus in on, like making the right decision and making it at the right pace. Those were two things that we were concerned about. The decision-making has improved. And it will continue to improve. I think it does for a defenseman who's pretty good at IQ, especially as he he gains more experience. I'm a, I'm a more optimistic than you on the pace thing. I don't think it's going to be a rapid ascent like Siders was, and I do think it's still a very big barrier to overcome. And it might have to be where they ask him to simplify his game or defer if he's not going to be able to to execute at pace or if he's going to get caught because he takes a half step too long to make that decision. But I think I saw, and it's hard in a nine-game nine game sample, I think I saw enough improvement there where I'm excited to see the next, hopefully, 82 games. I don't think, you know, something I said on a previous episode, which as I was editing, I'm like, why would I say something so stupid? Maybe not so stupid, but just so, like, optimistic is I thought maybe Edmondson by end of next season could challenge Wellman for first line minutes. And it might shake out that way where just on line optimization, sure. But as you think about it a little bit more, I think Edmondson's going to be a year over year project as he gets to his peak. I think overall, yeah, you have a, a guy who could be borderline elite, if not more, a lot still has to come together. I should have clarified this. I don't think the pace is ever going to come for Edvinson, because at no point in his career to this point has that been a feature of his game. But that doesn't mean you can't make it work without. Uh, obviously, I don't ever expect him to hit this level, but if you want an example of a guy who doesn't play with much pace but really makes it work, Victor Hedman. But Hedman has two things going for him where he is literally world-class at. He's generally the biggest and strongest guy on the ice while he's out there, so even when if he's a half step too slow, uh, nobody's getting the puck from him anyway, so it doesn't matter. And two, he's generally the smartest player on the ice when he's out there because he plays the game. You know, a lot of people talked about this with Lidstrom, like he's in a rocking chair. He really slows the game down mm -hmm. and approaches it like I'm controlling what's happening out here. You are all going to do what you're going to do, and I'm going to optimize the play based on that. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I know Edmonton doesn't have the IQ of a Victor Hedman on the ice to the point where he'll be able to do it to that level. But you can play and slow the game down to what you want. Yeah. But you better be making the right play 98% of the time when you're doing that because you're going to face pressure. There's a lot going on in front of you, and you have to break down what's going in front of you. Yeah. And when you are the smartest player on the ice, you can do a lot of good with that. Because the longer you hold the puck, the more the defense panics and the more things kind of happen in front of you. So it's not like Edvinson needs to add pace that he doesn't have to be effective offensively. But you have to understand how to work with what's in front of you when you are playing the game slow. And so again, timing is a better word. 
timing's a really good word for that, right? Yeah. Um, so the nice thing with this, and we talk, I talked about it earlier, the slower you play, the, I find it actually the more beneficial defensively because you don't overcommit. You don't panic. You don't blow coverages. You let the game come to you and react accordingly, and that's what most of the elite defensemen in the NHL do. Yeah. So I, I actually think that's a big benefit for Simon defensively. But, yeah, if he wants the counting stats to come offensively, he's going to have to, A, pick up the pace, which I don't think is going to happen, or, B, really, really nail his decision making okay the other defenseman you know we've talked tangentially about Hronik he's no longer on the team so that is what it is happy about the return um I think correct me if I'm wrong Brett Brad but between Hag Lindstrom and Osterley uh Lind Hag is an unrestricted free agent Osterley is an unrestricted free agent uh Lindstrom is an RFA with Arbright's <sighs> Bottom pair guys, filler guys, I, I don't think not a lot to be said. I think Lindstrom's career or Lindstrom's uh, a play really kind of trailed off in terms of what he could do. I would have hoped even as a bottom pair guy to see a little bit more from him this season, but it, it, it wasn't always bad, but at times he was part of that liability. Hag, same thing, was brought in. Fil filled minutes, I, I don't think it was, um, you know, if you want to find an example of, oh, you signed this, no name guy or, or low impact guy, and look what he did for your team. Doesn't always go the Oli Mata route. Hag is uh, an example of that. Osterley, I, you know, if they want to bring him in as a, a six seven guy, that's fine by me. But those three, I, there's not much to be said. They were. That is part of the problem with the Red Wings' depth is that they needed those guys to play too many minutes, even if it was just on the third pair. Like you need more effective NHLers, players who are more consistently above replacement level playing on your third pair. Because, you know, Hagen and Lindstrom would have one good game, and I would say on the podcast, wow, they turned it around. Look how good that game was. Lindstrom laid a few big hits. They were really effective, and then the next game would be like what a Hag's worst. So, I don't know. If Lindstrom stays because he's still young and and they want him to be that 6-7 guy, then that that's fine. I, I'm not going to to split hairs on this, but I don't think you want all three back next season is a good summary of this season. I think there's a coherent argument for you to want any of them back. Yeah, could be. Realistically, they were. If Johansson comes in and pushes, if whoever comes in and pushes, yeah, by all means. Well, like I said, I think the left side uh, of the defense is set for next year. Um, so I think that renders Hag and Osterley. Well, Osterley Poorly. sometimes flips. I, Osterley was the guy I liked the most out of the three of them. So if you are going to bring back any of them. It's him, but given that Lindstrom's an RFA, that's probably the most likely, and he's young enough that you hope there's something else there, which time and time again he's proven there isn't. Um, but he shoots right, and he's an RFA, so he's the most likely. Yeah, I, I mean, when you get to a bottom pair in the NHL, you're not expecting much. What you're hoping for is a specialist. A guy who, okay, this guy's really good defensively, really sound, really positionally solid, provides nothing in transition and provides nothing offensively, but you know you're not in trouble when when the puck's near him in the defensive zone. Well, none of them provided that. Maybe the guy's really good in transition. Okay, he's he gets, you know, in a few too many fire drills, but when that puck's on his stick, you know it's exiting the zone efficiently, quickly, and without too much risk. Yeah, none of them did that. Okay, this guy's a liability defensively and, tra and transition, but he gets in the offensive zone, and boy, can he make things happen. So if you partner him with someone really reliable like an Olimata, he's worth having on the bottom pair. Nope, none of them did that either. So they literally were just bodies to fill minutes. Yep. That, that's, that's the most polite thing I can say about what they provided the Red Wings this year. So, yeah. You probably have to bring one of them back just for the sheer numbers of it, but all of them are beyond replaceable and probably should be improved upon with whoever they bring in to replace them next year, whether that's a Scott Mayfield, a Radko Gudas, uh, pick a prospect out of Grand Rapids that might surprise you. Yep. All in all, you know, their best points in the season is when they went out there and their shifts were net neutral, which did happen for stretches, but sometimes it would be just like a, Oh, wow. Hag and Lindstrom got stuck out there and they got exposed. So that's, you know, you're not going to hang on the third pairing. I, I don't think the Red Wings expected much different 
from their uh, lowest in the, in the depth lineup guys. And like you said, Brad, you want fewer of those every year as your defense improves. Okay, as you can see by the time, uh, we won't have time to do the defense today, so we'll put them in with forwards. That was the defense. Or sorry, the goalies. Uh, we'll put them in with the forwards uh, for part three. Of, Maybe we'll do a four-parter. Let's get weird. A seven-parter. Hashtag off-season content. Yeah, yeah. Well, at some point, we have to start looking forward to next year. But uh, next episode after this one will actually be uh, not part of our season in review series. It's going to be a little bit of a different episode uh, to make up for a lack of prospect profile. So stay tuned, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely wrap up the series and we're going to get you the forwards and the goalies uh, and coaching as well. But for now, uh, very quickly to summarize and uh, more on this next time. Also, uh, Brian Lashoff uh, wrapped up a fantastic uh, career, largely in the AHL with Grand Rapids Griffins, but uh, 130 some odd games with the Red Wings as well. The utility man, uh, phenomenal player in person for Grand Rapids. So uh, kudos to him for a great career. And it sounds like he's going to stay in some capacity to work with Grand Rapids, which is great news. More on that. And uh, world championships. We're starting to get a little bit more on who's going, who's not. Sounds like Sider and Larkin aren't. Uh, and uh, Lucas Raymond, I think they just had to work out some insurance issues or they may already have, but he'll be playing for Sweden. And uh, Newsy, Derek Lalone, is going to be an associate coach for Team USA. So there will be more players emerging, but that so far is uh, what's been discussed. All right, let's get into overtime. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast if you want to support the show. Again, our bonus episodes, the Winged Wheel Podcast Discord, and all of our uh, giveaways you're automatically entered into. That's some of the benefits. And by supporting the show, you're also supporting our uh, expanded Winged Wheel Podcast content network, included, ex- including Expected by Whom, a uh, show that seeks to uh, prove that analytics and the human side of the NHL can coexist, hosted by Prashanth Iyer and Sean Shapiro. Uh, their coverage is league-wide. Uh, their knowledge of the Red Wings is also uh, top-notch as well. So uh, I think there's something in there for everyone. And uh, our first ever uh, expansion show. So by supporting the Winged Wheel Podcast Patreon, you also support them. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. All right, let's take a few questions before we have to wrap up here. Jack Mullen says, if the Wings can't secure the elite shooting slash scoring forward that they need, is there a path for them to be competitive as a Carolina-like team? And if so, is that only a path to playoff contention or can they be cup competitive with that kind of roster construction? Um, is this a point where we point out Carolina has several elite shooting forwards? Yeah. <laughs> they have an Andre Svechnikov, a Sebastian Aho, Marty Nachash. Marty Nachash. Um so short answer, no, because they're not built like Carolina just yet. Philosophically though, I can see it. Yeah, Something that Carolina had that allowed them to do this though is a stout defense. They have an absolute elite defense. If you want to look at what's the Red Wings best case scenario with the path they're going down right now. And again, it's still not a one-to-one comparison because the Red Wings still obviously need to add the 2019 blues are probably the model for where Detroit's heading right now. If you want to go, how can this core of, young players and prospects win a Stanley Cup as they are. The year the Blues did it is probably the closest example to what the Red Wings are currently building towards. Now, you go trade for a Kyle Connor and or an Alex Debrinkit, that model changes, but right now that's probably what they're looking at. Uh, Evan's short gorm goals says listening to the PDO cast the other day and they spoke about how Ehlers has never really fit in with the Winnipeg system, uh, which has led to his lack of ice time despite a positive overall effect at five on five in the power play. You think his uh, quote problematic reputation might give Eisenman some pause in trying to acquire a guy that might not be tw- team friendly or is this a wallman like fruit waiting to be plucked? Also, what kind of return do you envision Winnipeg asking? Well, that's the caveat, isn't it? Um, Eisenman's a big culture guy, and that Winnipeg organization right now looks like one of the more toxic locker rooms in the NHL. So do you even risk touching anybody in that room at at fault or not? The counter is at some point you're going to need talent. No, I agreed. I agreed. And I, you know, without knowing what Eisenman likely knows, Ehlers is very high up my target list depending what Winnipeg does. Now we talked last episode about... Winnipeg's, you know, financial situation, maybe not letting them rebuild, Mm -hmm. but if they do, and on paper, they're the prime candidates to do it. Yeah, you look at Ehlers. So 
I'll kind of turn this into a bigger answer and try to make it as short as possible. Look at what Ottawa gave up for Alex Debrinkit last offseason. That's probably pretty close to what you're giving up for Kyle Connor, maybe a touch more um, if you're acquiring Kyle Connor this offseason. So that was a top 10 pick and a very high second round pick. Hey, look, the Red Wings could do that right now if they wanted to. Ehlers will cost less than that, but not a ton. So I would probably move the top 10 pick to a late first. So maybe Boston's pick next year. And you're probably still giving up a decent pick and or prospect on top of that. Uh, I don't know who that pick would be. Let's just go Albert Johansson off top ahead. That's probably what you're looking at for Ehlers. All right, and uh, we are running long here, so let's take one more question. This one from uh, Lower Spirits says, Gentlemen, thank you for another amazing year of content covering the team we love. I started as a patron with you guys during the Raymond draft coverage. That's who I'm going to be asking about. I'm also a Coyotes fan, the only one in Michigan. Uh, Do you think Raymond has a ceiling to be a Clayton Keller mid-80 point player? Keller is three years older and point production was pretty close to Raymond's when he was that age. After watching both a ton this past season, I can see some similarities between the two. If you're talking ceiling, yes. Yeah. That is Raymond's ceiling. But it's always important to remember players usually don't hit their 100% ceiling. I I would say ultimate ceiling based on his talent. Raymond could probably, as, as scoring goes up in the NHL, maybe do even more. Not you know, every year for the rest of his career. But I don't think it's crazy to think, yeah, Raymond could be push 90 points on the right year on a high caliber Red Wings. This version of the Red Wings, no, God, no, they don't score enough. But, you know, with some better talent, and these are, I'm talking, these names aren't on the Red Wings or in their system yet, maybe. But yeah, I I think that range of player, like that kind of star player who's going to contribute at among the highest levels outside of, Bonafide superstar, one hundred point getters. Yeah, that's that's Raymond's ceiling. Okay, uh, we're gonna wrap up. We're gonna be back with you on Sunday. Um, in case you haven't figured it out, this is all pre-recorded, by the way, which is why I haven't talked about playoffs. So this was a recording Tuesday night, the Max interview much earlier. But we're gonna be back with you on Sunday night uh, with a special uh, prospects themed episode. So stay tuned for that one. For all of you who are listening, thank you so very much. If you want to support the show and you can't uh, or don't want to on Patreon, another way you can do it is subscribing wherever you're listening and uh, give us a rating. It makes a big difference for us. So I uh, appreciate you doing that. Uh, to all of our patrons, thank you so very much. Patreon.com slash Podcast if you want to support. And uh, to our name level supporters on Patreon, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Bertuzzi is straight up missing, Nick Perks, Icon, we are Geelong, the greatest team of all. Glenn Brabham, Aiden White, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Admiral Matt S. at the Cheesebag Navy, Babe Landiscog, Bros Before Hosas, Carl Brutina Nenoluski, Chimmy, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hockey Town Matt, Hassal Malkasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Matt McKay, Michael Udland, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Red 3, Ryan Hubbard, Ryan, the Ryan Hannah Hannah, Scott Martin, Send It Seawolf, Shahid Syed, Scree and Lube, That's What I Appreciates About You, Unpickable Nose, Wallman's Elite, Dancing D, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, uh, Sam Bankson, number one Detroit Red Guys fan, A.A. Ron, Adam Gowitska, Adam Rose, Antonio Gracias, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, CJ Wilkinson, Commander Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, Evans Short Term Goals, Evans 2018 Kitchener Road Puddles, Frank Stanley, Grand Rapids Hockey Guy, Griffey Boy, Instructions Unclear, Cheesebag No Longer Fresh, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, JM Rhapsody, John Evans, John Engels, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Matt Keeler, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Ophelia, Softcore Butter Guy, Steven, The Hodag, and Tatar Sauce. Thank you all so very much. We'll talk to you soon.
Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.